robotics, autonomous systems and artificial intelligence or RAS AI will provide important asymmetric advantages to Australian defence. RAS AI can be used in multiple defence applications including war fighting, logistics and humanitarian support. For all of these applications, humans are legally and morally responsible for decisions or actions that use RAS AI. That is why Defence has identified responsibility as one of five important facets for the ethical use of RAS AI. This video is part of a series which unpacks all five facets. These are responsibility, governance, trust, law and traceability. We will delve into aspects of responsibility from the perspective of Defence personnel, including operators and Defence scientists. Using examples from Army use of unmanned ground vehicles and a fictional scenario called Striking Blind, this video will consider human responsibility for the technologies they employ. Through these scenarios, we will come to understand the importance of knowing how a system has been developed, how it behaves and how to use it. And we will explore the necessity of providing education and training to commanders and operators to empower human agency and ensure moral responsibility. The Australian Army recognises that human-machine teaming offers a potential revolutionary shift in how ground forces plan, train and fight. Major Chris Hall has worked on trials that use robotic vehicles for the resupply of combat teams and unmanned aerial systems for reconnaissance and resupply. He is exploring how Army might use RAS AI in the future and how human machine teams should be trained. This is not an area that I had worked in prior to the last 12 months, but after a range of experiences using RAS AI systems against a live thinking op4 on uh, major exercises, I've been convinced that uh, these systems are the way forward in achieving increased lethality and protecting our own people. Uh, it will be very difficult in future for a human-only team to match the lethality and the tempo that can be generated by a human-machine team. In 2021, Combat Team Charlie experimented with unmanned ground vehicles in a resupply and logistics role, uh, carrying much of our heaviest kit uh, like uh, ammunition and water. Um, this greatly extended the amount of time we could stay in the field without a resupply. It enabled us to move faster and lighter and it reduced our signature and the battery charger on the unmanned ground vehicle also provided power to our other systems such as radios and UAS. The first time we stepped off on a mission within an exercise using an unmanned ground vehicle, within 30 minutes we had it uh, firmly lodged in a creek line and, and bogged. It took about 45 minutes to extract the, the UGV uh, from the creek line. So that was not a great start to the mission, but it showed that we had not fully integrated that system prior to stepping off on an exercise and it taught us that integration of RAS AI systems uh, is something that is going to have to uh, have time and, and soldiers and equipment allocated to it before we reach commencement of a challenging mission. Any tool or weapon can be used uh, unlawfully or unethically, but ADF teams with a strong military ethic will use them correctly like they currently employ their weapons. Responsibility is a key aspect of legal and ethical use. To be used effectively and ethically, we must be clear on who is responsible for RAS AI at all stages of the technology's life cycle, from design to deployment and review. Responsible use of RAS AI will require us to draw on expertise from multiple domains, including law, to help us govern the use of the new and novel technology. My name is Lauren Sanders and I am a Doctor of International Criminal Law. Um, I've spent 20 years in the military um, as both a signals officer and a legal officer and my area of expertise is largely operational law and the application of international humanitarian law to ADF operations. So when it comes to responsibility, command responsibility has a legal definition when we're talking about the use of force in armed conflict. So commanders have a particular responsibility in the decisions they're making and they have obligations as a part of that as to what information and what information standards they need to adhere to to inform themselves of those particular decisions. So in Looking at the use of RAS AI, the decision making at, and where it lies along the chain, whether it's the autonomous system making the decision or whether it's an autonomous system informing a commander's decision, has implications for a commander and for defence more broadly about how to utilise that RAS AI system. 
As Chief Defence Scientist, Professor Tanya Munro is Head of Defence Science and Technology Group, DSTG, and Capability Manager for Innovation Science and Technology within the Australian Department of Defence. We need to bring those ethical considerations right to the front of that discovery process so that we make sure that that future we create through science is something that meets societal expectations and doesn't go beyond what we consider ethical application of science. The responsibility for AI squarely sits now with everyone, both from the point of view of how we use AI but actually more fundamentally from the point of view of our data and how our data is shared and then used in AI. I put it to you that the responsibility for AI use sits with the individual. As a citizen and as part of broader society, every day we create data that is used in AI against us, whether it's targeted advertising or you know, any way in which we front the electronic world. Now, in the context of defence, there's no question that AI gives advantage. And we want that advantage to be asymmetric, to give Australia the chance with our allies to prevail in a contested environment. So there's a responsibility that sits on defence to make sure that we have clear standards, expectations of behaviour of both of our civilian and our military personnel for the responsible use of AI. That then, of course, has to adhere to international accepted legal norms. Defence itself has an important responsibility in developing the expectations, norms and ways of using AI. We're keen to get after the capability advantage AI can bring, and that produces a natural enthusiasm. But adopting AI too early before we fully understand some of the unexpected consequences or adverse outcomes of that technology would be rash. So it is absolutely critical that we work very closely, defence, the academics, the industry developing these technologies to look at specific scenarios to better understand what we need to do in terms of doctrine and norms of behaviour to make sure that we both get outcomes from AI but don't have some of the inadvertent, unexpected outcomes that we don't seek. Also critically, as we develop AI technology, we need to make sure that ethical considerations are just at the heart of everything we do so that it makes it easier to make sure that AI does what we need it to do in a way that complies with legal international norms. Responsibility for critical decisions is spread across multiple decision makers. RAS AI can help augment human decision making and offers advantages in precision and reliability. However, these technologies also have limits. Any decisions made using AI must be captured using frameworks that indicate ethical and legal responsibility. This will be important in all uses of the technology, but will be especially important when it comes to the use of force. The complex challenges RAS AI poses for defence were explored in a 2021 Perry Group paper called Striking Blind. The story reflected on how decision makers might be held accountable for acting on flawed recommendations made by artificial intelligence. Sean Hamilton, um, I'm a pilot uh, with experience on Super Hornets, Classic Hornets and a little bit of time flying remote piloted aircraft. So the Perry Group is started by Major General Ryan. Um, it initially started at looking at science fiction, but it's recently transitioned to looking at what he calls useful fiction. Um, so leveraging off books like Ghost Fleet, uh, written relatively recently, to explore future ideas and hypothesize how that might affect us uh, in the business of warfighting. Our story was striking blind, um, and our sponsors from Army headquarters wanted us to explore the impact of trust in autonomous systems. So what trust looks like, how you develop trust, and the impacts of having an inappropriate level of trust, either too much trust or too little trust. So the striking blind uh, story is about the ADF putting a artificial intelligence system called Mandela into service. The fictional Mandela system is a decision-making tool that provides information about the presence of hostile forces in the battle space. Our story is not set in a high-end war, it's set in a low-tech uh, separatist uh, conflict in the Philippines where we're assisting the Filipino uh, government uh, re-establish control uh, over areas of territory. 
Um, Mandela AI is there with the ground force commander and it's helping identify targets using all source uh, intelligence so that we can engage threats to friendly forces uh, more effectively. Um, it allows us to get greater speed in decision making, greater accuracy in decision making. The AI is in its targeting recommendations is assessing distinction, proportionality, necessity, uh, humanity, uh, and also the national rules of engagements and caveats. The fictional Mandela system is rolled out quickly into an environment that was likely not anticipated by system developers. Mandela relies on information from the environment, including mobile phones and other networks, and enemy forces confuse the system through spoofing and network denial. My name is Beck Marlow. I just finished Staff College and as part of that I did the Peri Group option and we were looking at AI as part of our Peri Group module. So the scenario was a, an AI targeting system uh, that had been introduced and was being used um, alongside loyal wingmen as part of the Air Force targeting system, but it was also um, being utilised by uh, ground-based um, targeting officers to assist in identifying and verifying targets uh, in the battle space. So the system identified a, a, an enemy target that turned out the target was actually civilians um, and that 93 civilians have been killed by this um, strike. So the targeting system had, due to the information feed from the enemy, had said that the, this was an enemy position and where it was actually a civilian position. It was fleeing refugees from the, from the conflict that was occurring in the scenario. The team who authored Striking Blind were particularly interested in exploring how responsibility for use of RAS AI might work. I'm Dominic Tracy, I'm a Logistics Ordnance Corps major with a petroleum background and I was involved in the development of Striking Blind, which was a peri-group paper to looking at AI for the future and implementation in the battle space. This is where the responsibility and the use of AI becomes more complicated within the military sense. On the surface, it is the pilot who pulled the trigger to engage those targets on the ground. But when you look at the introduction to service, the testing and validation of that um, it becomes a system or a whole of system responsibility and that each key component within the system is responsible for different aspects of that decision even though their input was well in advance of the decision that was made on the ground um, because AI when it gets brought into service has IP issues, uh, learning, um, how it learns, the data that goes into the learning, the articulation of risk for decision makers to decide to use that system and the feeds that happens for the pilot. Does the employment of AI change the commander's responsibility? Uh, we would argue fundamentally no, in that they are responsible for making sure that the laws of armed conflict and rules of engagement are adhered to. But the extra problem that we've got with putting AI into service is making sure that the commanders understand when they're expected to trust an AI's recommendations um, and when they're expected to question it. Uh, because that could be fairly blurry and we need to clearly uh, document that down. So you would theoretically have a higher authority or certification uh, organisation that's continually monitoring the AI and giving the commander very clear policy guidance on when they're expected to just take the AI recommendations and uh, when the AI could be operating out of the bounds that it's certified for and therefore the commander needs to step in and um, either take the AI out of service or question the decisions a little bit more. The catastrophic error in the striking blind story prompts a Senate inquiry. In the Senate inquiry, uh, initially it's the uh, viewed as the commander being responsible because that's our current framework, but it's pointed out by one of the senators that the commander had essentially lost free will uh, due to becoming conditioned in uh, trusting uh, the Mandela AI. So uh, we would argue uh, that the accountability should be held at a higher level in the authority that puts the thing into service, uh, the authority that's responsible for continuously accrediting it and making sure it remains battle worthy, and then the authority for um, allowing it to be employed in a specific theatre for a specific purpose and period of time. Responsibility is encoded in the law that governs how Australian defence operates. Damien Copeland is a senior research fellow in the University of Queensland Law and Future of War Group. Damien's research focuses on the application of export control, arms trade and sanctions regimes relevant to the export and brokering of trusted autonomous military systems and associated technology. He has over 30 years of military service.
My name is Damien Copeland. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the University of Queensland and uh, part of the Law and the Future of War research team. Our role is to investigate how the law both enables and constrains the use of autonomy in defence. The law applies and holds the, account, uh, the commander accountable and, uh, and others for the lawful use of the AI, which is one of the many tools that may be available to a commander in any particular situation. So if we look at this scenario in Striking Blind, then the question is, did the commander have sufficient information to enable the decision to be made to, uh, to authorise the strike in those particular circumstances. So if we look from a legal perspective, um, the law requires that those who plan or decide upon a, an attack to do everything feasible. Firstly, to distinguish between lawful targets, that is, enemy combatants and military objectives, and unlawful targets, that, that is those who the law is designed to protect, uh, victims of armed conflict, civilians and civilian objects. So in the context of the scenario, is it sufficient for the commander to rely exclusively and on the recommendation of a single tool, an AI tool, or does the law require the commander to do more? So the answer to that lies in understanding what everything feasible requires in the particular circumstance. So in the scenario then, uh, is, were there other uh, inf sources of information available to the commander? Could he have called upon the ground forces who he was uh, uh, ultimately aiming to protect to provide more information? Could have he, he have asked the, the, the bot aircraft uh, to conduct a, a, another sweep of the area to try and ascertain more information um, in, in the, you know, under the, the cloud level, for example. So these are the sort of questions that are relevant from a legal perspective to determine whether or not uh, relying purely on, on the AI recommendation is sufficient. Commanders are responsible for how RAS AI is used. Education and training should be provided so that commanders and operators understand the limits of the technology they are using. The striking blind story is a demonstration of what can go wrong when commanders do not know the limitations of a system. Uh, in this particular instance, the AI um, misidentified the target uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, the insurgents in this particular village had uh, taken away all of the electronic devices from the civilian population, so Wi-Fi uh, wi routers, mobile phones, transmitting devices, which took away one way that the AI could sense that there were civilians present in the area and start mapping uh, population movements. Um, and then on top of that, the AI didn't notice that all of those devices had been taken away because there was a foreign actor spoofing electronic emissions. And over time, because the AI was sensing that spoofing in every successful engagement it had done leading up to this engagement, each time it successfully engaged a target in the presence of this spoofing. Within striking blind, fundamentally, the, the issue or the cause of the incident was a lack of understanding and training when it came to risk of using AI. It came down to the risk of not understanding risk of the implementation of AI at the start when it was rushed into service. It came in the training uh, and testing and evaluation of the AI during its infancy and introduction into service and the training of the pilot in the use of the AI to not understand the risks that are associated with the decisions um, that the AI has a bias for. When it comes to RAS AI, commanders and their operators need training that helps them interpret confidence ratings when the AI categorises persons and objects. Corporal Lachlan Jones is an infantry signaller dedicated to improving the capabilities and experiences of his fellow infantiers. He is currently in training to become a systems engineer and works on a variety of new technologies and data systems that enable autonomous systems to operate. I'm Corporal Jones, I'm a member of a support company working in 1RIR's innovation space. As with any military equipment or weapon system, the operator is responsible and should be expected to operate within how they've been trained to use the equipment. Soldiers can be better equipped in the moment by well-structured training, uh, comprehensive training, more time on tools, as well as running through scenarios. 
Responsibility for actions taken by operators ultimately sits with the commanders, whose roles are backed by legal authority. The commander is always accountable for the actions of the team, but I would draw an analogy between an individual uh, mistake made by a soldier and a mistake made by a single RAS AI system. So if one soldier in a company commits a negligent discharge, we would hold that soldier responsible. But if 50 soldiers in a company committed a negligent discharge each, uh, we would say that there's a systemic issue that the commander should have accounted for in employing their force. So similarly, we don't need commanders to be able to predict every individual action of every RAS AI system on the battlefield, but they do need to understand them well enough to be accountable for the results of that system. The combat team commanders of future human machine teams in the next conflict have already joined the army and are lieutenants now. A officer of the very near future will need to understand the capabilities of an armed UGV or the Air Force's loyal wingman capability as much as they understand a, a Abrams tank or an FAA team. A good starting point for raising this generation of officers would be the combat officers advanced course and the logistics officers intermediate course. These courses, uh, which also integrate for part of their training, could implement human machine teams in simulation and tutes. Students who have completed that version of the course could then be tracked through to subsequent postings at uh, the Royal Military College Duntroon and Land Warfare Centre. There, they would begin teaching human machine teaming to our ab initio trainees uh, and our junior officers. Those uh, students at the college would then flow through having been taught human machine teaming in tutes and their field assessments into the regimental officers and logistics officers basic courses where they learn to employ RAS AI systems in a core specific environment. They would be the first generation of officers who could be consistently taught about human machine teaming throughout their career up until they become combat team commanders. We need to employ a similar train-the-trainer model in order to raise a generation of soldiers who are comfortable with RAS AI systems. A starting point would be implementation of human machine teaming in our junior leaders courses and our core specific subject two and subject four courses. Students who complete those courses would then be tracked through to subsequent postings at uh, Kapuka and our core schools where they would implement human machine teaming in recruit and core specific uh, training. Another issue we need to look at in soldier training is minimising the training burden where many systems are very similar. So a soldier might complete a three to five day course to learn the principles of employing uh, a multi-rotor UAS system. But when they need to transition to a second system, that should be a one day conversion course. Technology will continue to evolve too quickly for us to sacrifice our soldiers for multiple weeks at a time every time a new variant is introduced into service. Responsibility for RAS AI is an important issue. To ensure their own legal and ethical requirements are met, commanders and operators using RAS AI will need to be confident that the technology will perform as expected and in line with legal and ethical requirements. To use these technologies effectively and ethically in defence, we must be clear on the limitations of different systems. We must also ensure that commanders and operators understand the responsibility frameworks that govern their use. Central to all this is the creation of the ethical frameworks and tools that empower human decision-making and ensure responsibility. Because humans are ultimately responsible for the actions of RAS AI.